I'm Jill. Um, this research comes out of, or the need to do this research comes out of my PhD, which I completed back in 2020, which looked at barriers to adaptive reuse. And in particular, it had a focus on vacancy. So I'll bring in a bit of that knowledge uh, that was honed through the PhD around vacancy as well. Uh, but today I'm going to talk to you about focusing down from the big picture that Alison presented to looking at the specifics of what STAR could be um, and where it comes from um, and how that sits in a range of suite of strategies that we can use to reactivate buildings um, in going forward. I'll also talk around adaptive reuse and what are, what's the difference between adaptive reuse as we know it and the difference between star definitions and where we see star, um, star's place in that asset management um, uh, role. I'll give you a couple of insights as well from the pre-workshop survey. Thank you for contributing to that. So I've got a couple of insights from that today. Um, and see where your comments align with our thinking. Um, and then we're going to run into an activity which is snakes and ladders to help gamify and consider the feasibility factors that affect STAR both positively and negatively. Okay, so through my PhD I looked at vacancy and I've noticed in the room even today and from all the literature that's available, we talk about vacancy as though it's one thing. It's just, it's just vacancy, but we really need to unpack what vacancy is. We know that there's churn, so vacancy happens when one tenant moves out and before a new tenant moves in. We know that vacancy happens within leases, so you might have a space that's leased, but the occupants have changed their business needs and there's a lot of space floating around. We call that grey space vacancy, so that's vacancy that's surplus to tenant's requirement, but it's not available for lease on the market. And then we have untenanted vacancy. Untenanted vacancy is advertised for lease. Then we have mothballing vacancy, vacancy that we know is there sitting in a building, but the building owners have decided not to advertise that and they've taken it out of the market. So when we say vacancy, there's all these layers of vacancy and different types of um, and reasons for why space is vacant. COVID's added a new layer to that because we've also moving into this hybrid, working from home, uncertainty phase as well. So when we talk about vacancy, we need to say, what kind of vacancy are we talking about? And then there's time scales, short term, medium term, long term. But one thing that we do know is that vacancy is a real um, indicator of the risk of assets becoming stranded, assets becoming obsolete. It's a risk of uh, economics being depressed because you have a vacant space that, um, that's going to have an impact on revenue collected from that space, but also on the visitation to the CBD or city centre. It's also going to have a depressing effect on the businesses that's, that um, survive of people visiting that space as well. So we have lots of different tools or strategies in the asset management toolkit in order to reactivate or to manage buildings. We have asset exploitation, consolidation, where we bring smaller spaces together and make one large space or in the opposite direction, perhaps. We have demand repositioning where space is taken out of the market um, and not advertised, or maybe we look at additions to a building to activate new components to a building to um, reposition that asset. Creative demolition, demolish some of those parts of those buildings. We have asset renewal where we look at re, um, renewing the property through a meanwhile use, I've got here, or an alternative use. So that's where STAR is kind of sitting. It's within a meanwhile use or a alternative use for the building. And then we have obviously the obsolescence issue where you're removing that physical building from the um, building stock and you're redeveloping that site. 
So we see star and adaptive reuse as just one option that's available to asset managers. And I, it's really important to know that because um, as we pick up, sorry, as we pick up the literature around adaptive reuse, there's a, almost an over advocacy that adaptive reuse is going to solve everything. But we need to be aware that it's just one tool um, in that strategy, but it, it could be the best tool for some of the buildings. So it's around today understanding what are the feasibility aspects that decide, you know, what is that? Why is temporary adaptive reuse the right option for this building? And not kind of getting swept up in the whole star um, or adaptive reuse advocacy that everybody should be doing it. It's just one tool. So back in 2011, Sarah, this is your diagram. <laughs> Um, from Sarah's earlier research around building adaption. So we've got adaptive reuse. We've also got building adaption as well. So we, in adaptive reuse, we have a change of use. In, with adaption, you might have a retrofit, a performance upgrade, um, upgrades for disability access, energy efficiency, and also to make the building safer. Um, and what Sarah's work did was highlight all the different ranges of options that you could have through adaption. And then my research that said, hang on a minute, we have all these upgrades that we can do. Adaptive reuse is one of those. But what is the vacancy mix that we have in the cities? All the research, adaptive reuse research, says that Adaptive reuse should be done on a permanent and whole building basis. There's not a lot of research out there around meanwhile use. There's not a lot of practice guidance for industry around meanwhile use. And certainly not, if I pop to here, adaptive reuse on a temporary and partial building ba um, basis. So from my own PhD, which looked at um, cities that have high, historically high vacancy levels across Australia, like Adelaide, Perth, Darwin, they've always had a vacancy issue on a cyclical basis. Um, from those cities, we found that vacancy might say, or the high average vacancy rates might be quite shocking. But when we dig down into the vacancy data, there isn't actually that many buildings wholly standing empty that vacancy was spread between the premium A and B, C and D grade buildings. So that's not suitable for whole building permanent adaptive reuse. What we've got is the pockets of vacancy, untenanted, grey space, churn, spread across the building stocks, particularly for the office building market. So while research is saying let's all adaptive reuse, it's more sustainable, it's the best solution, it didn't suit this distribution of vacancy across the city. So that's where STAR comes in. We've got pocket STAR, mixed level STAR, so STAR across two or three, four floors. We've got um, temporary adaptive reuse as well. So on here I've got W bar, <laughs> mum la, pa and ta. And within a building, to reactivate that asset and to maximize that asset, you might be considering more than one. And we need to move the conversation away from whole building permanent adaptive reuse. So what is temporary as well? That's another big component of this. From uh, some recent research from Baker and Moncaster, they looked at the UK building stocks and they said that change of use was happening on around 7 to 15 years. So even in the building stocks that we're, you know, we're familiar with, even they're undergoing some level of change of use on a fairly regularly, 7 to 15 years isn't that long. I've also got a slide there, a picture of the Pantheon in Rome. This building has been a zoo, a church, bomb shelter, administration shelter, tourist attraction. 
So adaptive reuse isn't new. And what is temporary? This building is what, 12, um, 125 AD? <laughs> and it gets regularly renewed. So it, we've always been doing it, but we don't re really have the guidance around the practice, particularly from a supply side and a demand side and a regulation side. And that's what we want to tease out of you guys today to help inform the tools. So going to the pre-workshop survey, you guys responded and the biggest time scale that you thought was temporary that you all agreed with was up to one year. STAR is around one year in your minds and your thinking, which certainly does feel much more temporary than Munkansters work around seven to 15 years. So for Sydney, we're gonna roll and go for one year. We're gonna do temporariness, even though we don't really know what temporary or permanent really is anymore. And we've certainly experienced that ourselves. I've been through all Melbourne's lockdowns and uh, the disruption is my only permanence now. Um, so we've elaborated on Sarah's original 2012 taxonomy of different um, options for obsolescence mitigation. And STAR in particular is that change of use, but to break that, unpack that a little bit further, there's different kinds of changes of use. We've got a cross use, so that's going from a completely different building class number, from one to three or residential, four to 10 or non-residential. So moving from, say, a uh, five to uh, eight, that's where we call a cross use um, adaptation or adaptive reuse. And then we've got within use. We're all familiar with this idea that offices are gonna have to change, but they're gonna stay offices, but just look quite different. That's a within a use adaption. Um, and this idea that building, we've got this office building, but now we need to shift to, we've got a whole suite of mixed use buildings perhaps. At a single building scale, to get vibrancy within the building, we need to think about the existing tenants, what they need. We need to think about the spaces that we have and the demand for those new spaces and what that looks like. We need to look at what we have currently and where the gaps are. But on a citywide scale, we need to create resilience in the city centre. And I'm shifting the language from CBD to city centre because the city, the CBD might not just be business districts anymore. We need to do that from an environmental, sustainability, climate change perspective, but we also need to do it from a COVID impact perspective, create resilience, create a different mix in the city so that when acute stresses and shocks hit, we have a different kind of building stock that what we lean on the other sectors uh, to create vibrancy. We also know that STAR could be different for the premium grade buildings compared to the secondary grade buildings, the C and D grade buildings. So STAR could look quite differently across the sector. So we've got change of use from office to something else um, to address vacancy, to avoid obsolescence. But we also have this other mix now, which is around flexibility and being an attractor to bring office workers back in. What does the office building need to provide office workers moving forward? Do we need doggy daycare? Do we need childcare? Do we take the top stories and change that to aged care homes with a fantastic view across the harbour? take some of the space out of the market, put new things into the spaces we already have to support a different kind of office building. Going back to you guys in the room, having thrown all that at you, one of the, uh, these are the reasons that you wanted to come to the workshop, meeting other people that are interested in STAR. 
considering it from a feasibility perspective, hoping to add and share knowledge. I think that is also what office workers want as well. Networking, sharing knowledge, learning is also how we, why the reasons that we come into the CBD. So I'm hoping all that amazing motivation to be here today is going to lead us into the next exercise, which looks at star feasibility using snakes and ladders. We're all familiar with that, and we're all able to draw either a snake or a ladder, I reckon, with a fat pen. And what we want to do is to think about the feasibility aspects that could either enable or challenge the likelihood that star is feasible. We're going to use a pestle analysis, so political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental lenses on the feasibility um, factors that you consider are important. And I've, um, I'll leave this slide up at the end. I've also got some crib sheets for you that go through some of the key issues from the literature that will help start conversations under these headings for reactivating office buildings. That comes from the British Council of Offices um, in the UK looking at obsolescence. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some A3 sheets of paper, or A4, in the middle row of the paper, which is here, you're going to write the feasibility factor that you think is going to affect the likelihood of star. And draw some ladders to highlight points that are more likely or somewhat likely to positively affect the likelihood. And some snakes drawing down from your factor to say what, you know, what's going to make it really unfeasible? What's going to only have a small amount of impact on a feasibility? Something that perhaps we could get, get around with a bit more thought or a bit more analysis. Um, I've got two examples on the wall. We've got um, from a supply side, example one, we're looking at maybe how do we attract new tenants for new spaces? How do we do speculative star? How do we know who will come and rent out these spaces? So it's around understanding what is the market demand for the new use that you're considering. You might have done some um, research with your existing tenants and say, you know, what would you be happy having in that office mix? Um, and then you might have understood the rental returns of those new uses, and that's likely to have a good impact on the feasibility and your confidence in the decisions that you're going to take towards STAR. Or it might be that there's a real lack of analysis around those new markets. Maybe someone's proposing a new use that is really off the wall, but you can see that there's some good logic behind that. But there's a, a lack of confidence in moving it forward, perhaps as a financing issue because of that lack of confidence. Um, or it might be really difficult to connect with new t tenants. How do you access people who, who want new space? From a demand perspective, then um, it would be around identifying the spaces that are vacant, that are, do have building owners that are prepared to try something different, trial a new use. So it's around the flexibility of that space. What are the clauses in that contract? How do we get around the fact that you have to make good a space afterwards? If you want to do something quite radical to that space, you've got to return it to an office building. Is that part of your costs, or is the landlord going to be a little bit flexible around that? I will leave up that example as well for you to come back to. And we've got lots of crib sheets with the pestle analysis broken down with some key notes for you to pull from as well. Um, but anything that comes to mind that affects feasibility, what I'm hoping to do is sweep the room with all of your ideas and build that into a feasibility tool um, that we can then start to offer and prompt landlords and space users to think, right, you need to think about your STAR project from these perspectives. And the hope is from this feasibility tool that we can draft, we go into workshop two, and the people in the room at that space will validate and 
and review the tool.